Welcome to the Attention Deficit Disorder Expert Podcast Series by Attitude Magazine. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. This is Wayne Callan for Attitude Magazine. Today's topic, Organizing Solutions for People with ADHD, will provide us with tips and strategies that I'm sure all of us really need. Every day at Attitude, we receive emails and letters from readers and visitors to our website asking for help with organizing stuff at home or at work. It's funny how many of us can keep our desks at work neat while our homes are a huge mess. I don't know if anyone has been able to figure that out yet, but I'm sure today's expert Susan Pinsky has. She is author of the book, The Fast and Furious Five-Step Organizing Solution, as well as Organizing Solutions for People with ADHD. Susan lectures frequently about organization on TV, radio, and in print. Susan will discuss her approach and strategies about organization, giving us the framework for making sure that clutter doesn't get to the point of overwhelming us. So Susan, it's good to have you here. We can sure use your help. Thank you for having me. In the uh, dawn of my career as a professional organizer, I had a client, an artist, an uh, incredibly creative, talented woman, brilliant, and we would organize a space in her home, a studio or a bedroom, and I would come back in a week or two, and not only would it be undone, but sometimes it was worse than before we had started. Around the same time, uh, my husband and I began to notice that my daughter wasn't really functioning very well. We ascribed this to that maybe she was a sort of the absent-minded professor type. And when the second child came along and was outperforming her older sister, we just figured that kid was a genius of pragmatism. But then when the third baby came along and that kindergartner could uh, get dressed, get her lunch in her backpack, and get out to the bus in a timely fashion while her older sister was still uh, the fourth grader, still sitting on the floor of her bedroom staring at her socks, we realized, uh, Houston, we have a problem. My daughter was soon after diagnosed with ADHD, and as I began to research the, the syndrome, I began to tailor my organizational methods to better respond to my daughter. And we began to have some success. Uh, at the same time, I also began to realize that this artist client was having some of the same behaviors and symptoms, which I now know to be ADHD symptoms and behaviors. So I took some of the methods that I was using with my daughter, and I began to apply them to this artist client, and for the first time, we had success. So the question became, why was it that the tried and true tools and tricks of the organizing trade were not effective for my daughter or for this client? And the answer is, is that not all organization is appropriate for everyone. And bottom line, not all organization is good organization. And let me give you an example. I could organize your shoes by putting all of your right shoes in the attic and all of your left shoes in the basement. Hey, it's organized. It's just not efficient. It's too difficult to get your shoes, and it's certainly way too difficult to put your shoes away. As it turns out, all organizing is a, an equation. It's an equation of time, space, money, and effort. When we are organizing for ADHD, we want to give the greatest values to time and effort. Efficiency is our battle cry. We want systems that use the fewest number of steps and the least amount of effort. We want things that are simple and streamlined, that are maintainable and manageable. So how would I now organize shoes for someone with ADHD? In my old, uh, my old system might have been, like other organizers, to put the shoes in, in clear shoe boxes and to stack them in a closet. Makes them very space efficient. You can have a lot of shoes. Uh, but if I did that for my ADHD client, the first time she got her shoes from the bottom of the stack, she'd have to unstack all those boxes. And I guarantee you, when she got home, she's not going to stack them all back up. We're going to end up with shoe boxes cluttering the room. So how do I organize for that client? Well, we reduce the number of shoes she owns to the number that will fit in a single row along the back of the closet. When she gets home, she toes off her shoes and she kicks them into the closet in one simple motion. She doesn't even need to bend down. Is it pretty? No, but it's efficient. Of course, when you're using, uh, when I'm reducing my client's shoes to the number that will fit in the back of her closet, we're having to reduce. And that means that my client has to be resourceful using one pair of pumps, maybe for uh, every dark outfit in the winter. And she has to be resilient about, about not owning as many shoes as let's say Imelda Marcos. 
<laughs> but make no mistake, the shortest, most direct path to efficiency is reduction, which is a very hard sell in our consumer gimme, gimme, gimme acquisitional society. I once heard a Tupperware commercial. The commercial went, uh, for this low price, you will get 50 pieces of Tupperware. You will be so organized because you will be prepared. Whether it's a drumstick or a roaster, you will have the correct size Tupperware. Well, here is what I know. I know that if you have 50 pieces of Tupperware, you are not organized. You are drowning in Tupperware clutter. It is better to be resourceful with a fewer number than to be overwhelmed with a mountain of Tupperware. It is better to let a drumstick roll around in a big Tupperware or divide your stuffing between two. As my sister-in-law once wisely said, if you have leftover Tupperware on Thanksgiving, you have too much Tupperware. Uh, in, in my home and, and in other ADHD homes, I reduce the Tupperware. Uh, we get resourceful with a little bit of saran wrap and, and, and tinfoil if we run out. On the slide that you're seeing before, if you look to the cabinet to the left, this is a typical uh, Tupperware cabinet in a home, but I can tell you that only one person in the home knows which lids belong to which containers. Nobody can help pull out Tupperware or unload Tupperware. In the slide to the right, the, your father-in-law can, can come into the kitchen after the game and put away the Tupperware, grab what he needs. Your son, and your, your seven-year-old son can unload the dishwasher. Because three of the Tupperwares are the same size, the lids are interchangeable. We only have two that are outsized, and they're obviously outsized. For in this paradigm, you have to be resourceful with a fewer number of Tupperware. You may run out of Tupperware after two or three days and then have to, horrors, eat your leftovers to free up some Tupperware. But doesn't that keep your fridge then uncluttered? In order to, uh, to, to work with this system, we are resourceful, we are resilient, and we are ignoring aesthetics. That middle slide, that's, that's beautiful, but what a waste of my clients' time and attention to repackage their Cheerios when they already come in a perfectly good box. The golden rule of organizing is that inventory must conform to storage. In an ADHD home, we want inventory to be less than storage. We want empty shelf space and empty drawer space. Organizing, make no mistake, is about the last step. It is about putting stuff away. It's about maintenance. There is no organizational system in the world that will work if it's not maintained, if you don't put things away. In an ADHD home, I work for a three minute or less cleanup in every room. There should be no room in the home that cannot be picked up in three minutes. Dinner should be able to, if everyone pitches in at the, to clean up dinner, should take no more than 10 minutes to clean up the kitchen after dinner. Again, you know, only one or two people know the, the amazing Rubik's Cube of movements that have to, have to happen to put things away in that stressful looking cabinet. By eschewing frugality uh, and sentiment, we reduce the number of items in the cabinet. Uh, and on the right, you, we will notice, though, that we did buy more dishes of the same type so that every dish is the same. You never have to move a dish to get to another dish. That cabinet on the right looks restful. And it almost seduces you into wanting to unload the dishwasher. Again, your seven-year-old son can help out. Your sister-in-law can help out. Because there's no magic series of steps to unloading the dish into that cabinet. Now, in order to make that cabinet, we had to get rid of a lot of the pretty stuff on the left. But we did that in order to make a pretty space on the right. We sacrificed pretty stuff in an ADHD home in order to create pretty space. For uh, most of the homes I go into, 30 to 40% of what I do often is get rid of the garbage. Not identify, take, not convince people to get rid of things they want to keep, but actually help them get rid of the stuff they've already identified as garbage. Why has the garbage not gone? Because the garbage flow system is inconvenient or inefficient. In one home I went into, uh, the wife was complaining about the husband. She points to the counter, look, you can't even throw out the garbage. Look at there's paper towels, there's, there's banana peels here. Uh, so I asked her, show me the garbage in your home. Well, she walks over to the sink and she unlatches a child latch, even though the children have long, are long since past child latch age. And she puts her foot up and steps on a pedal so the top of the garbage goes up just like four inches before it hits the top of the cabinet. And then she awkwardly stuffs something in there. Well, of course, this husband isn't using the garbage. It's a waste of his incredibly valuable time and attention. In this home, we took the garbage out from underneath the sink. We took the lid off and we put it in a prominent place next to the cabinet. Uh, in this way, the husband can just wing something into the garbage can uh, almost as easily as he drops it on the counter. Will he, we get perfect compliance? Uh, no. There, he will still occasionally not put things in the garbage. But when she... Uh, 
goes to clean up after him, she will be less resentful because even for her, it will take less time and effort and energy. Uh, is it a beautiful solution? It is not an aesthetically pleasing solution, but it is more aesthetically pleasing than having garbage all over the countertops. As it turns out, garbage is a finishing step. And for those with ADHD, finishing steps are the toughest. We're all excited to pick paint colors, but none of all of us find it tedious to wash the brushes after the painting is done. For those of us, for those of us without ADHD, a task that uh, like a finishing task such as doing the garbage may be tedious, but for those with ADHD, they experience that as almost torturous. It is a sprint. So we have to take those finishing tasks and we cannot expect them to sprint cross country. They can sprint four yards. So let's reduce those finishing tasks and streamline our systems so that it is a short and workable sprint. Laundry is another multi multitask uh, chore. And for most of my clients, their, their clothes are on their bed and on the couch and on top of the bureau and nowhere near the drawers. And why is that? It's because putting the laundry away is the finishing task of a very long multi-step uh, chore. In, in most homes, uh, I'm able to create usually something as you see on the right that's a, a bin system. This, this eliminates even the opening of drawers. You can just take your basket in and wing your clothes into the, the bins. I know they look neatly folded here, but, I, but let me assure you that this gentleman did that for the picture. <laughs> they do not normally look that way. But a jumble of jeans in a bin that's just jeans is organized enough. This man was also able to manage the gold star of organizing, which is that he reduced his clothing, winter and summer, to the amount that will fit in his closet. There is no awkward, inefficient, and inconvenient dragging bins out of the attic and living with them on the floor for six weeks in fall and spring. We also, in this, uh, if you look in the bottom right-hand corner, you can see his sock bin. Again, this is usually a jumble. He kind of straightened it for the picture. Um, we threw out all of his socks, and we went out and bought khaki socks and black socks, the two colors he wears the most often, in, uh, so that every khaki sock matches every khaki and every black matches every black. If they match, you never have to, you can leave them in a jumble and you never have to match and roll socks again. Uh, I believe that sorting and rolling socks is a complete waste of my client's valuable time and attention. And even my own, I you know I have not matched and rolled socks in uh, almost 20 years. Again, this gentleman has reduced, so we have no seasonal switch, which has uh, eliminated an entire task and made his, uh, his his whole life more streamlined. Every home I walk into has, uh, it seems to me, always a hamper. I don't know why it's a laundry hamper, but a laundry hamper of shredding. I don't know why the laundry hamper is, seems to be the go-to container. Um, <laughs> it turns out that you don't really have to shred your old credit card bills and your bank statements. It's all this unnecessary shredding that has got people, that has got my clients bedeviled. Uh, they are shredding because, let's face it, the news media runs 24-7, and sometimes there are slow news days. And in the slow news days, they run these horror stories of identity theft. But really, identity theft is about your social security number. It's on 10 documents a year. If somebody gets a hold of your credit card number, that's credit card fraud, and the credit card companies take take care of that. Aside from that, here you are shredding your credit card statement when you're handing that same credit card to a stranger, what, four times a week, five times a week? And couldn't that waitress take it behind a, 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 the bar and write down the security code? You're, you're writing checks to strangers. Your account number's right there at the bottom of the check. These are public numbers. They're meant to be shared. Um, we don't want to, you know, we, in an ADHD home, it is prudent enough just to deal, just to destroy the social security number uh, papers. Again, those are about 10 a year. You file your new taxes. You throw out the ones from seven years ago. There's maybe 10 or 15 documents, and you don't need a shredder. You can Sharpie pen it and tear it in half, put one half in with the coffee grounds in the kitchen, the other half in with the bathroom once a year. And So what are you going to do with all this paperwork that you are not shredding? You are just going to throw it. See, in the, in the slide to the right, you'll see what I call the slow paper recycle or slow paper trash. Uh, this bin, if it's, about a, if it's about a foot high, should take a year to a year and a half to fill. If it's not, you don't, we don't use this, this bin that lives in the office. It is not used for uh, cereal boxes. It's not used for the newspaper. It's just for office paperwork. It turns out that 80% of what people put in their file drawers, they never take out again. Filing is a finishing task, the most difficult kind of task for those with ADHD. And 80% of it is unnecessary. So I encourage my clients to take all of their paid bills, 
uh, in all of their just-in-case papers and throw it in this recycle bin. Because it takes a year and a half to fill up, if they really do make a mistake and they really do it turns out on that 1% chance needed, it's there. It's filed chronologically. They can dig it out. We use the same system. I'm going to go through and just show, show the same systems uh, for kids. Again, we have a very fussy mother on the left, probably a professional organizer. She's having her child file his uh, completed homework, a complete waste of time for a child with ADHD. Instead, we use the same system, a milk trade under his desk that is empty in September. He can then unload confidently his uh, completed homework into that bin because we're not going to empty it until June. If he really makes a mistake and that unit is on the test, he can dig it out of that basket. It is filed chronologically. Um, in the same way that we've reduced uh, shoes and dishes for adults, we're going to reduce toys for children. My husband is the youngest of five. He had three older siblings. Back in the 60s, he looked at his toy box and thought, I have so many toys, a toy box full of toys. Well, there's not a suburban child in America that has merely a toy box full of toys. They have a playroom. It looks like FAO shorts. Uh, and that's fine. If you have a playroom and it's got a door on it and every toy in the house is in that room, none in their bedroom, none in the family room, because remember, we don't want to create a child-friendly house. We want to create a family-friendly house. If you ghettoize the toys to that playroom and the whole family once a week on Sunday together picks it up because it's too overwhelming a job for one person and there's a door to close for the rest of the week, and that's fine. But for families who have to have the toys in a family room area or in the bedroom because there is no space for a, a toy room, uh, and even for those families who do have a toy room, I would, have, I would even have you consider how many toys is appropriate. Uh, I recommend... If the toys have to be kept in a in a common room, two bookcases of toys. Your child only has one hand, two hands. How many action figures can he really hold? Uh, if you look at the the slide to the left, that those toys can be picked up in under three minutes because they're played with often. They will get they will they will often break and then get replaced by new toys. Children are more stimulated by new toys than they are by having. Uh, tons of old toys all around the house. If you do a brain scan, their, their brains light up at the new toy, not at the mountain of old toys. Uh, now we see a system, if you look to the left, the uh, Lego system of these, be these beautiful containers, they actually encourage the child to jump, to dump out the toys at the outset. They create mess before the child has even played. The less attractive container to the right, because it's shallow and wide, is, is awkward to pick up, and the child really can just run their hand through there and see every piece. They don't have to dump out to find the correct piece. In that, in the, in the toy storage system to the right, the child is only taking out those toys he's actually playing with. It is possible that your child will never be able to clean their room completely on their own without you blending them focused by standing there. Uh, clearly, if the toys are in the basement and, or in the playroom and there are no toys in the bedroom, that, that will be helpful. But sometimes you don't have time to stand there. I find an egg timer can be very helpful. You say to the child or children, I'm going to set the timer for three minutes. You are going to race as fast as you can and clip as fast as you can. Beat the timer, beat the timer. And when the timer is done, kids, the job is done. Now, mom and dad, that means that when the timer is done, the job is done. You, you got you to stick, with, stick to your word. But you would be surprised if you have made every room under three minutes to clean up uh, how much a ch children can get done in three minutes. Structure. A shopping list, if we're going to reduce the amount of, of items in the home so that everyone can be cleaned up in under three minutes, we want to make sure that, that excess doesn't come into the home. We don't want to recreate what we've just gotten rid of. Uh, in an ADHD home, and frankly, again, in every home in America, nothing should be purchased that hasn't spent some degree of time on a shopping list. So let's use, uh, for instance, groceries as an example. You have a running grocery list in the kitchen. Everybody understands when things get low, you write it on the grocery list. You get to the grocery store. Uh, milk is not on the list, but you're pretty sure you're out of milk. Don't buy it. You come home and there's no milk. The entire family can be resourceful and resilient about eating toast rather than cereal that week. The marketers would have you believe that to run out of a needed item is a disaster of organization. I say it is a triumph of organization. You should be regularly running out of needed items. It means that you are not tying up your money and your space and your effort in a bunch of things you don't need. You're at the store. It's buy one, get one half off. If you didn't have two on your list in the first place, don't buy it. They're not giving you half off because they like you. They want your money in their pockets and their clutter on your shelves. Routine. 
Look, I know it sounds like a drag routine, but frankly, it is just too much work to reinvent the wheel every day. So if we know that Wednesday is bill paying day and we psych ourselves up that we're going to come home on Wednesday and pay the bills, there's some chance that the bills will get paid. Now, of course, sometimes life gets in the way. ADHD gets in the way. You don't pay the bills on Wednesday. But when the next Wednesday rolls around, you have a sense of urgency because you know they weren't paid the week before. And in the meantime, you can relax. You don't have the bills as a monkey on your back every day because you know they're scheduled for Wednesday. Support. We use the timer and mom as a support for the kid cleaning the room. Uh, a, a neighborhood kid can lend support if they help you clean the garage. They can help you focus. At work, team up with someone. People with ADHD tend to be very smart, very creative, real idea people. They're coming up with ideas. Their brain is working faster than the rest of us. Team up with someone like me, a little pencil pusher who can dot the I's and cross the T's and file the papers at the end. Let's work to our strengths and make an effective team. When in your own home you are looking for uh, systems and how to, how to streamline your systems for ADHD, ask yourself, is it efficient? How much work does it take? Uh, can I do it in one step? Does sorting all of your laundry into, into different uh, colors make any sense? Does your teenage son really care if his tube socks are whiter than white? If we get it down to one load of laundry per person per week, uh, can can that one person do their own laundry? Can, uh, in, in my experience, even a 10-year-old boy with ADHD, if he only has one load of laundry per week, all colors the same, and a warm wash, is capable of getting that, getting that load through the laundry and back into his bins, if not his drawers. So efficiency is our battle cry. Uh, we're looking for the least, fewest number of steps, the least amount of effort. We want some things that are quick, we want it simple, and we want it efficient. Um, we're going to eschew all these other values, but here, but here is the, the ironic part of it. If I don't worry about organizing for beauty, but I remain more organized and maintain my space better, my home is de facto more beautiful. If I eschew frugality by not shopping with coup buying things I don't need with sh with coupons, uh, it turns out that in the end. I will be more more frugal because I will have bought less. If I eschew hyper vigilance by shredding, but I sit down once a week and do my bills and open my bank statements so I'm keeping track of my finances and can notice irregularities, I will in fact be more prudent. Once I had, uh, you know, once I had come up with a system for those with ADHD, I began to sort of speak locally in the area, um, and I was asked to write a book about it, which I did. It's very difficult in 20 minutes to give an entire methodology or address every particular of everybody's life. I mean, different things work for different people. Even in the book, you'll find, you know, it, it's a, it's just a template. You have to have to, you know, uh, adjust things a little bit for your own life and customize them a little bit. Um, I also was asked because because a lot of my interviewers and reviewers said, you know, these systems would work for anybody. And in fact, I do now use them for everybody. If someone's got a professional organizer in their house, they're struggling with organization. So why wouldn't I make efficiency the most important value? I use it in my own home because why, would, why do I want to fuss around with stuff if I can make it more efficient? But in any case, uh, the publishers asked me to write another book for the general population. I said to them, you know, it's going to be the same book. But they said the general population won't buy an ADHD book. So I did write the second book, Fast and Furious. It's a little less draconian. Uh, so if you're looking for something that's a little less draconian, you might you might check into that. Um, and I want to thank you, and I'm ready for your questions. Well, thanks, Susan. Um, I have to say I can relate to that Tupperware example. I really have. In fact, my unfortunately, our house at home, the, <laughs> our, our cabinet looks like the one on the left with yeah. the and there's only one person who can use it, so you're exactly right. right. Um, okay, there are a lot of questions about um, anxiety over throwing things out. A couple of uh, ways it's been put. One person says, why am I so anxious about throwing things out? Uh, a mother of a daughter says, my daughter has sentimental attachment to everything I suggest we donate or get rid of. Or she says she could use it possibly someday. How can I talk her out of this emotion? I mean, some of her excuses for not getting rid of things are far-fetched. Right. So we have two things here. One is you know, sort of anxiety at throwing things out. Uh, your average American, we, we have been taught through the years that it is wasteful to get rid of things. And let's face it, 100 years ago, if you had this much stuff, you had a valet and a laundress to take care of it. Right. Most of us, had a, you had two outfits. You had a workday outfit. You had a Sunday outfit. You had two hooks. So... 
you were careful about what you threw out because you didn't have much and it was difficult to reacquire. You may take a three-day wagon ride across you know, a, a mountain pass to stock up on food in January. You had to can. So we have been hardwired to be frugal with our stuff. And society up until about 100 years ago ha, ha, has reinforced that and that we haven't had that much stuff. But most of us are now living five minutes from a grocery store, seven minutes from a, from a hardware store. Uh, the idea that we have to put up cans to get through winters is ludicrous in our new day and age. So we have to teach. So that anxiety is uh, both hardwired and taught to us, and we need to challenge it constantly. What would it take to to reacquire this item? I had a lady. She had a 12 room Victorian, 10 rooms of which she could not walk into, and she said to me, "But you know, just six months ago, I threw something out and I had to reacquire it." I said to her, "Well, what did it cost you? It cost her 12.99 at the grocery store or at the hardware store." So all, you know, she is, she is berating herself for one twelve ninety nine mistake while there are 10 rooms of her home she can't use. If you get rid of things, and if you do it correctly, if you walk the line of only keeping things that you imminently plan to use and get rid of, rid of all the rest, you're going to make some mistakes. It is an organizational triumph to reacquire something you got rid of. It means you're walking the line. It means that you're getting rid of enough. You're not perfect. You're going to make the mistake. And you have to reacquire, say to yourself, yay, I got rid of enough. Uh, in terms of the daughter who has anxiety, a lot of people with ADHD are very good about getting rid of things. They've been losing their favorite blankies since they were babies. They're good with closure. Um, occasionally, though, you have some comorbidity uh, with a little bit of you know, rat packing into hoarding. I suggest that the parent be very good about getting rid of their own stuff, very sanguine, very phlegmatic. What's in the front? You know, the minute the parent wants to get rid of something of their own, it goes in the front seat of the car. The kid sees that the parent is constantly donating, so that it, that 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 behavior is modeled for them. And uh, I think if if a child sees that their parent is constantly donating and the donation is a part and, and getting rid of things is a is a part of their life, they will learn good methods. If the child that has some comorbidity with uh, some hoarding or pack ratting, you know, that's a little bit of a tougher nut to crack. Uh, but I would begin by even though it may not be rational, talking to them about everything in our life is a balloon. It's ephemeral. It comes in and it goes out. And uh, keeping something past when it's useful in your life isn't healthy. Remember, we're hardwired and we've been taught to keep. So look at, look at your own patterns and what you're modeling for your child first and see if you can get them there just through that. Mm -hmm. uh, another participant uh, asked, I paid over $400 in late fees on bills last year. I have the best of intentions when I receive the bill. I open it up, put a stamp on the return envelope, but then I get distracted, lose it, or just forget about it. Please help. Right. So I, I don't believe that you should pay your bills every day. I think that's inefficient to every day pull out your stamps, pull out your envelopes, pull out your checkbook. I think once a week is enough. Um, what that means, though, is that when the bills come in, you sort them in a bills-to-be-paid folder. There is a home and a spot for bills to be paid. I usually also have people stick their bank statements in there as well. So your, your mail comes in, you sort it, most of it goes right into the junk heap because most of it's junk, and you have this one spot called bills to pay. On, let's say, bill paying Wednesday, you take that one stack together to your, to your desk, and that's all you do until those items are stamped and in the in the uh, mailbox to go out. Remember, it's all about finishing the task. It's not about starting, it's about finishing. I think that this gentleman, because he's trying to do it as they come in, is creating extra work for himself, but all he really needs is a really good home that's just for bills to be paid, not for junk mail, not for, I've got to send this back to the kids' school, just for the project called Bills to be Paid. Uh, Elizabeth asks, there are many gadgets coming out for organizing. What's best for an ADHD or in their family? Well, I have to tell you that the entire world has changed. How I organized 15 years ago is completely different. In fact, we had to update the book. I used to talk about organizing your CDs and your books. People don't have books. In an ADHD home, an e-reader, not books. In an ADHD home, no CDs. I know they're, they're but you know, streaming. Uh, no DVDs, but streaming. And this gets rid of a lot of the physical clutter out of our lives. As much as possible, paying your bills on the computer and uh, getting rid of the paper so that you just don't have the visual clutter. Uh, I think that the, I mean, I've watched my clients, I've had this one client, she's just amazing. Um, I, I really recommend, and I'm not shilling for Mac here, but the iPhone syncing with a Mac is an amazing thing. You can have a, an alarm that goes off that repeats for medication, 
for even for your laundry. You put the laundry in the dryer and you don't want to have, I don't believe in ironing. I think that's a waste of time, but that does mean you want to pull it out right when it finishes. You put that repeating alarm on your iPhone and it goes off until you're done with that task and it keeps you on task. So the, the kinds of, you, you can put everything on your iPhone, the kinds of things that uh, we couldn't even imagine 10 years ago, we can now do with technology. Someone asked just simply, what is a good filing system for an ADHD? -er? So I do not believe in, mo for most of my clients, I get them down to 12. I have a, I have a file cabinet next to their desk. Let's, let's get a little broader. Let's go a little more global on this. You need a desk, and the desk should have a file cabinet next to it. And all of your office supplies should be at that desk. Because if you have to get up to walk across the room to get your, your checkbook from one corner and go into the other room where the stamps are kept, you're not going to pay your bills. If your stamps, your envelopes, your checks, your computer, your printer, your file cabinet are all in one space with a nice, rolly, comfortable chair and good lighting and a nice, clean, broad surface, you'll work in that surface rather than at the kitchen table. You don't want to work at the kitchen table because it's inefficient when it comes to dinner time. So now we've got our file cabinet. Uh, the, the world is changing. Again, we're using yet less and less paper files. I recommend a two-drawer file cabinet next to the desk because you can put, it extends the surface of the desk and you can put your printer on top. And for most of my clients, I get it down to six to 12 files per drawer, usually six. If you have six files in your top drawer and six files in your bottom drawer, you will, re you will be able to stay on top of your paperwork because you will remember what your files are. If we have 50 files per drawer, we can't remember our files. If you have 12 files, that means that you're not going to have a, one file called home insurance, another one called car insurance, another called boat insurance, another called health insurance. You're going to have one file called insurance, and in it are going to be four or five packets of your various insurance policies. That's okay. When you go into that, that it will be the, the point is to make it easy to file. Then health insurance comes in, you open that drawer, you, uh, you've only got six, six files in there, it's easy to find the insurance thing, the insurance file, you throw your new insurance in and throw out and, and dig out your old one. Because it's easy to file, you will file your insurance policy. If it's difficult to file, you will not file that insurance policy and it will float around your house among all the other random paperwork. Uh, I usually tell people to put their file drawers in alphabetical order because it's just easier. Everybody can, knows that I is sort of in the middle of the alphabet. I also recommend not color coding, but colors. If I know that my insurance folder is yellow and it's I, I know that I is in the middle of the drawer, so I know it's the yellow one in the middle of the drawer. When I make a new file, I just make sure it's a different color than the one that's before and after it in the alphabet. just helps my eye get there a little bit. Uh one wife asks, I like a place that is sort of neat and decluttered. I am not a fanatic, but my husband is perfectly comfortable sitting at a kitchen table piled with papers. I feel uncomfortable eating that way. We've talked a lot about living with less clutter. I am more than willing to take the lead on this, but I don't get much help from my husband. What can I do? You know, people have different uh, tolerances and comfort levels. Uh, and in any marriage, there's got to be a conversation. One of them is to, we, it was in the slides, but we didn't really talk about it, is to create boundaries around space. So your paperwork is done in your office. Your kitchen, your, your uh, cooking and dishes, your, your dishes belong in your kitchen because that's efficient. It's efficient to put your, your dishes away if they're in the kitchen where you use them. It's efficient to put your papers away if you're in your office next to your file cabinet. It's efficient to put your laundry away if your clothes are in your closet, not in the guest room closet, not in your son's closet down the hall. So we want to create, we want to find out why this husband likes the kitchen table. And here's what I'm guessing. He likes it because it's a big surface. He likes it because it's bright and there's a big window. Uh, he likes it because he can see the TV. Create that space in an office for him. Give him a nice big table next to his desk. If there's a, not a window, put in excellent lighting overhead. Get a little TV to stick in the corner if that's what he needs. And that way, you, you have to talk to him to find out what are the things that he likes about the kitchen. Ooch him off out of the kitchen and into his office. That way, if he walks away from that, that space and there's papers on it, it's not in your space. And that may be the compromise that's maritally workable, as opposed to saying to him, gee, honey, you've got to keep less papers. You've got to pick up after yourself more often. Yeah, that makes sense, I think. Um, another uh, adult asks, what kind of cleaning routine should I get into each day that wouldn't put me behind the eight ball when I come downstairs the next morning? I hate seeing dirty dishes in the sink. All right. So, Again, it's all about maintenance. Organizing is about maintenance. People think, that when I first wrote that book, my publisher said, can you do, you know, organized in seven minutes a day? And I said, no, you can't get organized in seven minutes a day. You can maintain 
in about 20 minutes a day, but you can't get there. So the first thing you have to do is go room by room, put it on your calendar, go through each room and reduce. I find that a bedroom takes about two days, one day to weed, the next day to maybe get whatever shelving you need or you know, put things away in an organized fashion. Kitchens take three days, a day to weed, and then after you weed, you sometimes realize, gee, I need a tray for this drawer. Or, uh, put them on your calendar, room by room, go through. Once the rooms are organized uh, and the items have been reduced so they fit comfortably in the drawers and shelves without moving things around, you should be able to maintain in any given day. And here is Again, this is the system we lived with in our home and that I've recommended in other homes and, and has been workable. Not that you won't ever get behind, because you will, but if you've reduced, it should not be that difficult to get back on top of it. I recommend that after dinner, the family cleans the dinner, cleans dinner together, and that means clean the kitchen, wiping down the counter, sweeping, and then you walk through the home and pick everything up. That way, when you sit down after that, and, and again, if, you're, if your home is if it's three minutes per room and you're doing this daily, it won't even take 10 minutes. Then you can sit down. Now, my husband and I, when we had young children, we would clean up from dinner. The kids would play. They would go to bed. And then right after bedtime, we would walk around and pick up their stuff uh, just because it was just one too many things to do with the kids. But once a day after dinner, walk around and put everything away. If you've reduced, if you've gone through the home and reduced, it shouldn't take more than seven, eight minutes. And everybody, everybody needs to chip in on cleaning up after dinner. You ate it, you clean it. It should be a family time. If you're standing there next to your kid with your, you know, I find that standing next to your kid with your hands in soapy water, those are the moments because they're not facing you, they're facing out the window. When they bring up the tough stuff, you know, I'm getting bullied or my boyfriend's pressuring me or, you know, these are important family moments. Mm -hmm. uh, another person says, I was thinking that we should rent out a storage space, pack up some of our stuff in plastic containers and take it over. My point is we have so much stuff that we don't know where to begin to start getting rid of it. I thought that moving some of the stuff away from the house would give us a fighting chance to see what we actually have. Do you have any okay. thoughts on that? Oh, oh, boy, do I have thoughts on that. So uh, <laughs> I'm trying to remember the numbers. I believe it is that in the 70s, there was no such thing as the self-storage industry. And now it is over 45, uh, I think it is million square feet uh, big. We had in the 70s, Larger families, three point something people, and now we're, we we have two point something people. Again, I don't have the, the figures in front of me, uh, and yet our houses have grown by a thousand feet. We have an average of a thousand feet more storage than we used to with one less person in our homes. Seventy five percent of people who live in Los Angeles can't park their car in their garage because it's filled with stuff. So what is happening? What is happening is that we are impulsively buying. I guarantee you, this person is buying things that they don't need. They're not waiting. They're not. Remember, we want, that, we want that, that shopping list. We want to actually have to say to ourselves, I am out of jeans. I need to buy a pair of jeans, not just go out and recreationally shop for jeans. Um, I don't believe in the self-storage industry. I believe if your items can't fit in your home, then you just need to get rid of them. I would go, again, room by room and reduce every item in that room uh, until that room is livable. The client will, the, the, I'm pretty sure this lady will say to me, but look, if I get rid of this pan, I want to put this pan with all these other pans and see which is the best pan. So you, you, anything that, let's say we're doing the living room, anything that's a kitchen item, stick in the kitchen. I get that the kitchen is cluttered and it will become more cluttered. Anything that's a, a let's say it's a bicycle helmet, stick it in the garage because that's where it belongs. I understand that if the garage is cluttered, you're not going to, you're worried about losing it. But when you get to the garage, at least everything that belongs in the garage will be in the garage. And as you reduce Things that don't belong in the garage, the things that are left will be the th will be all the things that belong in the garage. You have to go room by room. In that room, get rid of as much as you can and put everything that doesn't belong in the living room in the room it belongs to. Clothes in the bedroom, dishes in the kitchen, items in the garage. When the, when the living room is, and you finish the living room before you move on to other areas, because organizing is very disruptive. You only want to do one room at a time. When you finish the living room, you move on to the next, uh, the next space. I guarantee if you put those things in tubs where you can't see through them, and you put them off site, you're going to be paying for that storage for 10 years. There's nothing that's in those tubs that's going to be worth what you're paying for storage. Mm -hmm. um, Angie asks, how do I organize the projects and tasks that I am currently working on? If I file it, I never think of it again, ever, even when the deadline is imminent. Right. So most, so probably she is. She should really look very challengingly at all of her tasks. How much of what is she do, she's doing does she really need to do? Uh, how much of it is the sort of hyper perfectionist? It would be perfect. If, for instance, is she taking pictures of all of her donations so that she can get a a, uh, a tax deduction? 
Not worth her time and not worth her effort. Throw it in the nearest donation bin. Take that task off your plate. Uh, is she collating her receipts to make sure they came up correctly on her uh, visa bill? Guess what? It's a computer. It's not trying to rip you off. It may make a mistake, but it's worth, uh, you know, I consider it a lifestyle tax to occasionally have to pay $10 more on a visa bill, maybe, maybe, to never have to, to collate another receipt. She should look at all of her tests and eliminate all those that are based on fear and hyperprudence and hypervigilance. Um, the tests... I typically put a basket on the client's desk where things that really do need to be attended stand up in that basket. They don't lay flat because then you only see the top thing, just the stuff that's on top. Uh, just, the, just, you know, uh, the, just the, those things stand upright. Um, and anything that has to be done is done in that basket. And you can make it, again, you know, paper processing Tuesday. You go and you attack the basket. Once something is, a project is done, it, I, most of it goes in the slow recycle. Maybe, maybe an item goes in, in the file drawer. Um, does that help? Yes, I think it does. Uh, this one more is related to a high schooler. If you could share tips on how to keep a high schooler organized, it would be much appreciated. My son can't seem to keep his binders or work organized enough to remember to turn completed work into his teachers, resulting in lower grades than he should be getting. It frustrates him, me, and his teachers. Well, if I had the answer to this one, I'd be a millionaire because, you know... <laughs> If I could, get, if I could, so I, I, let me just say, I can help, but I can't solve. Um, one thing that is helpful, again, is that basket for completed homework under his desk. So he has a way to easily empty out his binders. You may need to do it with him every Friday. Lend him that focus. Say, look, on it's Friday, let's go through and get rid of all the completed stuff. So the things that are in his binders are only the things that are current, just like the lady with the desk last time. We, you know, get rid of the stuff that, that, that you don't need to to process so that the stuff that's on your desk is only the stuff you really do need to process. Um, there are a lot of school systems right now, not a lot, but there, are, there, there, is a, there is a paradigm shift occurring. There are school systems where the students do the homework at school and their homework is the lecture. They go online to hear the lecture. The beauty of that is you don't have to remember to bring home your book. You don't remember have to bring home your homework. Uh, and while you're doing your homework, if you have a question, the teacher is right there you know, next to you. It's, it's a perfect system for someone with ADHD. But even in, uh, you know, even in a less evolved school system, usually the assignments are online so the kids can find them. And if they aren't, I would contact the teachers and see if they, that can be set up. The assignments can be online so if the kid forgets what the assignment is, they can, they can go online. Um, so again, routine. On Fridays, we empty the, the, the binder together. I recommend that ADHD kids have one binder. It's too hard to keep track of three or four of them. I recommend that the backpack be brightly colored and it, and it live in front of the door the kid exits from the house. So the kid is done with their homework. They put it in the backpack and they put it in front of the door. You literally have to move the backpack aside to get out the door. Um, anything that goes in the backpack should go right next to that backpack. You have to move it aside to get out the door. Uh, will this solve the problem? No. Will it help? Sure, somewhat. You know, it, It's a teenager. Only so much can be done. Uh, this one person says, so you mentioned laundry day, mail day. What other days might you suggest? Shopping day. What else should be reduced to once a week? Uh, grocery shopping. Uh, you know, there again. And here's the thing. You should shop for this week. And when the week is over, your cabinet should be so empty that tumbleweeds are blowing through them. Uh, this idea that you're going to stock up for winter, uh, ridiculous in, in, in this modern age. So if, the, if you're keeping a running grocery list next to the, you know, with, which everybody has to sign in on, oh, we're out of Cheerios and everybody eats Cheerios, so they keep a running grocery list, that means that what you're, what you're grocery shopping for during the week are maybe four to five dinners. That means four proteins, four starches, four veggies, four fruits. That's all you need for dinner. So, uh, you know, chicken, lamb, whatever, uh, potato, rice, bread. Uh, so it's a very simple and simplified grocery list. Uh, what I recommend for grocery shopping is that it's done after garbage day. You, you're only getting four or five dinners because there's always pizza night and there's always catches, catch, can, uh, you know, everybody catches, do, does leftovers. Nobody's got time to cook because we're all on different schedules night. So probably four full dinners is as much as you want, four to five in a week. The night before garbage day is leftover night. That's the night you go into the fridge and everybody eat all the crap that's been left over from all week. <laughs> <laughs> then you can empty, 
Right, then you, anything that doesn't get eaten that night gets thrown into the garbage and taken out because it's garbage night. That garbage goes to the, goes to the, goes to the curb, and that's the day you grocery shop because now your fridge is empty, very organically your fridge is empty, and your cabinets are empty because you've used up all your food. Because remember, you only grocery shop for four dinners, so you had to kind of fill in. You have really used up your food. Now it's easy to make that list because you open your cabinets in your fridge and you can see that there's nothing in there, or you can see the three or four things you have left over. So I definitely recommend grocery shopping day, and I recommend it be tied into... So if your garbage is Wednesday morning, that means Wednesday is grocery shopping day. It means that Tuesday night is leftover night every week. That's so, very, very nice. Right, right. So and we also talked about bill paying Wednesday. In some households, it's bill paying slash paper processing Wednesday, uh, in some homes, though, we need to separate those out, and bill paying is its own project. It's too overwhelming if we do all the other things. You know, i got to call back about the kid's field trip. i got to register for the whatever. Uh, so in some homes, we have a bill paying night and a paper processing night, and they are, and they are separated. Mm-hmm. Uh, Zany um, has a challenge here. I have a problem with becoming overwhelmed just thinking about cleaning the clutter in one room in my house. I can't even walk in there. How do I overcome it? I've really tried, but end up just moving stuff from one room to another. I try to throw things away, but I just seem to accumulate more and regret what I have thrown away because I have, because I find uses for it. There's a lot. That's a lot. That's a big question. But I think the main thing is feeling overwhelmed just thinking about cleaning up the clutter. Right. So it could be for a lot of my clients. I, I mean, this happens all the time. I walk in, and the first thing they do is burst into tears, and the you know the, they're overwhelmed. Uh, even in my own, I'm a professional. If my garage looked like some of these people, and I, you know, and I was alone there, I'd be overwhelmed. I'd burst into tears too. <laughs> I'm fortunate to have a spouse. It's two people. You know, if it's a big job, we can share it. So if you're a single person uh, with nobody to share your job, I get it. You, you, uh, if you have, if there are two of you. You should both attack because everything is easier with two people. If you, uh, and then even sometimes, even if you have two people and they both don't have good organizational skills. It's, again, I'm not showing. Hire a professional organizer. Do it for one project. The skills you learn in that one project may be enough to carry you through the rest of the house. Uh, you know, my clients, they've they've never, they don't know even where to start. So when I walk in and say, we're going to start on the floor because that's going to make it efficient to move around. Once we're done with the floor, we're going to go to the surfaces because that will make it easier to sort things. Once we're done with the surfaces, we're going to go to the drawers or the interiors of the cabinets. And we're going to go room by room and project by project within the room. If we're in the bedroom, once we've got the floors and the surfaces clear, we're going to address the shoes. Then we're going to address the hang-up clothes. Then we're going to address the drawer clothes. Project by pro- We're going to finish the drawer clothes before moving on to the jewelry. Project by project, finishing each project before going on to the next one. The, it's a simple template, but if you've never seen it before and you've never experienced it before, uh, you don't you don't know how to you don't know you know how to be how to begin how to get in there um in terms of the i found uses for it look the, the thing with people of lots of stuff is they tend to be really smart they look at an item and they can come up with 16 uses because they're smart <laughs> they they <laughs> they they, are, they they look back um the key is to become cheerful and uh comfortable with the idea that just because i had a use for it or just because it would have been perfect there doesn't mean i should own it so what? Yeah, you know, if I kept that green shirt, it would have been better with this pair of slacks today. And instead, I'm going to have to wear this, you know, beige shirt that doesn't go as well. So what? It's the price you pay to live in a comfortable environment. And boy, it's a small price to pay to live in a comfortable environment. It's not the stuff. It's the space. You want the space and you want the time. The stuff is just stuff. Several people have asked about organization at work. They didn't want to really hear about organization at home. I guess their homes are just fine. Do you have some basic principles about organization at work that you'd like yeah. to pass along? So, you know, this, as you see, this presentation was a little more based on home because I have to, you know, I, there's so much information. Right. I can't, I can't do it all. Um, right. But just, but just quickly, you know, I mean, actually, we did this with my own daughter. I have to say, my daughter, we'd say to my daughter, where is such and such? And she said, I lost her into it we would yell at her. And then she stopped saying that. She'd say, oh, someone took it or whatever. We were teaching her to lie. And when we realized that we were doing that, we backed off and said, no matter what you say, even if you say, I have no idea, we will accept that. So now this kid is, you know, she's 26 years old. Uh, and what has, what 
and it still works for her. Someone will say to her, do you, you know, or a roommate, have you seen my whatever? And she'll say, you know what? I'm ADHD. It's possible I picked it up and put it down and don't even notice. My husband calls her the randomizer. Um, but what works for her in, with her roommates and in her work is that she's honest about it. If she really, if she, you know, if someone says to her, have you seen something or done something? She's, she's able to say, look, I don't remember picking that item up. But I'm ADHD, I may have done it. Or no, I didn't finish that. I'm ADD and I got distracted. So honesty is really important uh, because then people trust you and they're, they're on your side. The other thing, as we had talked about, was team up. There are a lot of us out there who love to organize. Put them on your team. You know, I, I, you know, I couldn't come up with a new idea at work probably if my life depended on it. Uh, when I all, all of these systems that I've come up with, people say, how did you get them? Well, first of all, I made all these mistakes in my own home with my own child and with my clients. And it was with the help of my clients and my ch uh, children that we began together to come up with systems that were streamlined, that we began to realize, why are we separating the laundry? Why are we separating out seasonal clothes? Do we really need that many clothes? That for, you know, Can't we just get another bureau and have a summer bureau and a winter bureau? Uh, team yourself up with someone who's a little bit of a paper pusher because you're an idea guy and apply the, uh, you know, apply the simplification system to your, to your uh, work systems. Um, make sure that your desk is comfortable. Make sure there's good lighting. Make sure the, the file cabinet is, is near you. Um, and, and routine in the morning, you know, give yourself, you, you can use your, you can use your iPhone as a timer in the morning, answer your emails, but answer them for 10 minutes. In the evening, take 10 minutes to clear your desk. But, you know, again, put it on your iPhone. You've got a three-minute timer on your iPhone. Take three minutes to clean your desk up as quickly as possible. So when you walk in the next morning, the desk is clear. Liam is asking, any solution for the out-of-sight, out-of-mind problem, which many ADDers have? Things I tuck away in drawers can mean that they disappear. I've tried labels, transparent containers, but I still can't recall where things get, where I put things. Yeah. So again, drawers, because they're hidden, you know, you're probably better with some open shelving than you are with drawers. The clear containers are good and labels are good. And those are all, those are all good. Uh, reduce, reduce, reduce. If you don't have that much, there's not that much to forget. You know, it, it, I had a lady and she, I wanted to get rid of one of her hammers. She said, but I can never find a hammer. I said, well, that's because you've got 12 hammers and 30 uh, Phillips head screwdrivers and 50 flathead screwdrivers. If you had one hammer, one, you know, one Phillips head, one flathead, and we put that on the workbench, you couldn't lose it because it's right there in front, because it's all that's on there. Uh, you lose things when you have too much because you, you know, because again, you can't remember 50 files in your file drawer. Uh, if you've got 12, if you've got six files in your file drawer, you won't lose them. Now, in terms of, of, of keeping things sort of about things to do on your radar by all, that's a different question. And that's really about calendaring and uh, to-do lists. I do believe in to-do lists. I believe they should be written out every morning. And I believe they should be thrown away every evening with the, the things that are transferred. Anything that's a long-term to-do, like, I don't know, here, here in uh, my part of the world, we have septic systems. They have to be pumped every two to three years. I write it on the calendar. You know, I write in November, pump the septic. And when November comes, if it's not this year to pump the septic, it says, not this year to pump the septic, write it on next year's calendar so that it gets <laughs> carried forward. We can now do this on the computer, right? The Google calendars will allow you. So most of your to-dos should go on your calendar. And if you've got a, uh, you know, if you've got an online calendar or a Mac calendar, it, you can, it, can, it can be done right there in the calendars. Today's items should go on a to-do list that you check off. Uh, some people are more comfortable writing on a piece of paper. Others you know, prefer to do it right there on their iPhone. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm afraid that has to be the last question. Um, I can't tell you how much practical stuff you've given us, Susan. I've helped me tremendously. I'm sure everybody else. So we all appreciate it. Well, it was my pleasure. Have a good day, everyone. For more Attitude Podcast and information on living well with attention deficit, visit attitudemag.com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-M-A-G.com. Whether you're looking to build a website for your business, your hobby, your podcast, or just for fun, Pair Networks is your go-to web hosting partner. Not only do we have the lowest domain price in the industry, starting at just 11 bucks, we've got hundreds of stunning website templates to help you stand out from the crowd. You're not a techie? Not a problem. With our easy DIY site builders, you can launch your impressive website without any technical know-how. 
and when it comes to security and updates. Don't worry, we've got you covered. Our 24-7 U.S.-based customer support is the best in the industry. Check out Pair.com today to learn more. P-A-I-R dot com.